Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture which we read just a moment ago. We're in the book of Exodus. We are looking at chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. Now we're picking up where we left off two weeks ago because, of course, last week was our Missions Conference Sunday, and Reverend Keith Coleman, the Executive Director of the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions, was with us, so I need to do a little bit of review. We're looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. And we're nearing the completion of rebellion test number four, which was at Rephidim, which is in a way a replay of test number two, which was walking by faith for water. Rephidim is where Amalek attacked Israel and God declared that he would have perpetual war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now we've talked about the connection between warfare and prayer. Prayer is also essential for the believer who is engaged in spiritual warfare. And that's important because just like God's war with Amalek was from generation to generation, even so spiritual warfare against Satan and his demons is from generation to generation as well. Central to all of that, of course, as we've studied, is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is intimately connected to prayer and to spiritual warfare. Let me read you Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and following, which we covered a little bit, but not enough. We're going to cover more of that today, the Lord willing. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your minds girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I, an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. That's highly significant, you know. Rephidim is about warfare and prayer. It was at Rephidim that Israel fought the Amalekites while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer as Joshua won a great victory over Amalek. We learn multiple principles of prayer from Rephidim. Let me give you a quick review. That event gives a physical illustration of the exhortation by the Apostle Paul regarding spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, which we've just read. So what we've learned so far in Exodus 17, where Rephidim occurred in comparison to Ephesians 6, is this. Exodus 17, 8, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. In spiritual warfare, Satan the enemy will attack you no matter what you're doing, but he will always attack you when you are walking by faith and in the center of doing the will of God. Verse 9, and Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek, Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. As in most warfare, there's a division of assignments. We've seen that. The selection of troops, those who are sent as frontline warriors, the chain of command, the logistical support. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And what we've studied in the past, we know that every subordinate officer must fulfill his role if there is to be a victory. Headquarters must always be kept apprised of what is going on on the battlefield. 
And it came to pass, when Moses had held up his hands, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. God's telling us something here. There are definite and doable steps in securing a victory. If you leave anything out, you are guaranteed defeat. You can't make up your own rules for spiritual warfare, just like you can't make up your own rules in football or basketball or baseball or tennis or any other sport. Lifting up of hands in Scripture is a symbol of intercessory prayer before God. With prayer, there is victory. Without prayer, there is defeat. And I say it again, as I've said it many times, you need to be here in prayer meeting. You may personally be the key to the failure or success of this church in the spiritual warfare that we are indeed facing. You may be the one step or key missing for the church to move forward in battle. You may be old or middle-aged or young or a teen or a child, but you are critically important to the spiritual warfare of this church. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Important principle here, especially for me, leaders get tired too. I gave you a challenge uh, two weeks ago when uh, we were talking about this before the missions conference. Try holding up your own hands in the air with a heavy stick for an hour. See if you can even do it for an hour. Sometimes a leader needs to sit and rest while still being involved in prayer, but others need there to be there to hold up his hands as well. Aaron and Hur needed to hold Moses' hands steady. It says they held them steady until the going down of the sun. It was not an instantaneous victory here. It lasted from early morning until sunset. Spiritual warfare is like that too. It lasts from early morning all the way till sunset. Aaron and Hur had an all-day job just like Moses and Joshua did. But it was a different job. It might have been boring, but it was critical to the victory. What boring job has God given you to do in prayer and in support of the pastor of this church? Are you doing it? Nobody is exempt from the spiritual warfare faced by Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. Verse 13, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now, we noted before that Joshua got credit for the victory, but it was actually a team effort. There is nobody, nobody who wins victory by himself. It's always a team effort. God was not forgetful to record the parts that Aaron and Hur played. Moses was the commander-in-chief and Aaron was the high priest, so we'd expect him to get some credit, but who was Hur? Because of his faithfulness, he was left with Aaron when Aaron was put in charge of the people when Moses ascended to Mount Sinai receiving the law. In Exodus chapter 24, we haven't gotten there yet. The Amalekites were an evil people. In fact, the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, means Jehovah is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. As you know, the Amalekites descended from Amalek, the son of Esau. I told you, I believe, a couple of weeks ago that a Bible scholar by the name of Jimmy DeYoung has traced the ancestry of Yasser Arafat and the genealogy of that guy who was the former Palestinian leader back to Amalek. God's word is true. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So last time in Exodus, we compared some of the key points in Ephesians 6 that are illustrated in Exodus 17. Ephesians 6, of course, is the Christian spiritual guideline to spiritual warfare based on pride. Uh, prayer, excuse me. We noted at that time that there were some other strange things that occurred at the death of Moses where a very strange spiritual battle took place. Jude, who wrote the book of Jude, is a spiritual warrior in his own right. In the book of Jude who is rightly referred to as the warrior against apostasy, we have a striking declaration in the middle of his military warning about spiritual spies who creep into the church and concerning their character, what the character of the apostates is. There's a thing in the middle of that that you say, wow, why did he stick that in there? Jude, verse 4 and following, Jude's only one chapter long. For there are certain men crept in unawares. So we got the spies creeping in who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord, Jesus Christ. 
I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. So we're back in Exodus. Here are the children of Israel. They're on their way out of Egypt. They're going through the 10 different rebellion tests as they go through the wilderness. And so here we have Jude going back to that, going back to those beginning points for national Israel. Having saved the people out of the land of Israel, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Illustration number one is Israel in the wilderness. That's an illustration for the church to watch out for apostates, the spiritual spies who creep into the midst. Then he gives illustration number two. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. We'll say more about that someday, I hope. Illustration number three, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now he's using all three of these illustrations to talk about apostates, the spiritual spies who creep into the church and try to defeat you from inside in the middle of the spiritual warfare. So he says, likewise, he's going back now to verse four, the ungodly men who have crept in. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. We find those three illustrations that he just gave illustrate all three of those points which are key character qualities of the apostates. Now, here's our verse. Remember, <clears throat> In the spiritual warfare, you are not on your own. You yourself cannot win the battle. You must have all of the spiritual armor, including the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. That's the only thing that you have as an offensive weapon in that entire list of armor. Everything else is defensive. The Bible, the word of God, is the only offensive weapon. Faith is a shield to keep the devil from knocking out your faith. But the Bible is the sword that you have to fight him with. Now listen to verse 9. <clears throat> Here he's telling you that you can't do it alone. Yet Michael the archangel, now how powerful is Michael the archangel? <laughs> Top angel, okay? Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. You remember, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, God told Moses because he had violated the second time that the rock was going to give water. The first time, God said, hit the rock. He hit the rock, water spewed out, everybody got a drink. But the second time, God had said to him, speak to the rock. And Moses was mad. He was really tired of these people, dragging around several million people through the wilderness and they were always belly aching and complaining. So the second time, God told him, speak to the rock, and Moses stood up in front of the people with the elders of Israel and with Aaron, and he said, what ye rebels, must we bring ye forth water out of the rock? And whack, he hit it again. Now God in his grace gave water. But God said to Moses, because ye have not sanctified me, in the eyes of the children of Israel. You will see the land, but you won't go in. And God took him later to the top of the mountain. And God took him home, but his body was there. And that's what Jude is referring to. The devil was contending with Michael over who would get control of the body. Because if the devil could have gotten hold of the body, what could he have done in terms of leading Israel into wickedness? Now that's a warning as to how we should approach spiritual warfare and prayer is one of the key weapons. Don't fall into the charismatic trap of trying to rebuke demons. Even Michael didn't do that. So looking now at Ephesians 6 and spiritual warfare. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There are two things. Number one, the armor and prayer are indispensable to spiritual warfare. Just remember that, indispensable. The spiritual armor and prayer are indispensable in spiritual warfare. Second thing to notice 
is the strength is not your own. It says, in the power of his might. Not your power. In other words, it's a strength that is provided by the Spirit of God. Lessons that we get out of verse 11 here. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Number one, you cannot ignore any part of the armor. That means you can't downplay the essential need for individual and corporate prayer. Now, I think probably most of you are involved with individual prayer. But remember, soldiers do not fight wars alone. They fight in an army. There are at least two armies in every conflict. Not a bunch of freewheeling agents who are doing their own thing. This section in Ephesians chapter 6 is specifically addressed to my brethren, plural. That's a group. Specifically, that's a church at Ephesus. But it's a reference to corporate prayer, not just to individual prayer. <coughs> Second thing we learn out of verse 11. Although each soldier will face specific soldiers from the enemy side, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they must fight side by side so that they will not be overwhelmed by multiple foes at once. They have to fight in concert. If they're always bickering and fighting among themselves and criticizing the other guy because he didn't tie his shoelaces right-handed instead of left-handed, or because they say, you know, your face looks a little bit dirty, go back and wash it off before you come to fight. If they're always doing that kind of stuff, they will lose. You do fight individual soldiers in the battle from the enemy side. But you fight in concert with other soldiers who are in your army and as you move into the conflict. Same thing is true in any athletic contest as well. You may not like some other team member, but you know what? When you're on the court or on the diamond or on the field, you are going to do everything you can with that person to beat the other side. You say if your dislikes for each other, for some other play is definitely off the field. And you are on the field. You're not off the field right now. And when you get off the field, that means you've gone to heaven. And you know what? There'll be no more conflicts there. Number three, the third thing to remember about verse 11. When soldiers fight, they're at the same location at the same time. That's the whole point of the church. Gathered for prayer. Gathered for prayer. You go to the field with the rest of the soldiers and you fight with the rest of the soldiers and spiritual warfare is like that and prayer is essential. Number four. Let me make a pointed little application as to why some of you are facing some very critical issues. Critical spiritual, emotional issues, physical and temporal issues and defeats in your own lives. May I suggest, though this is not the only reason, of course, that you never show up for prayer meeting, and when you show up, you show up late. You know, you're getting knocked off by the enemy. Can you imagine if a soldier's platoon moved into position and engaged the enemy, and one soldier decided to show up late? Folks, some of you are always late. That is not good. Number five. There are at least three guaranteed serious consequences for that kind of a soldier. And it's true not only in physical battle, but it's true also in spiritual battle. Number one serious consequence. The soldier who does that puts his fellow soldiers at risk of death. Thus, risking the safety and the defeat of the larger unit. Number two, he puts himself at risk of death because he is a highly visible, open target as he moves across the battlefield alone and he doesn't have anybody covering his back if he gets attacked by multiple soldiers from the opposite side at once. You put the lives of other soldiers at risk, you put your own life at risk. Number three, and this is perhaps the most serious of all, 
He puts himself in serious jeopardy with his commander-in-chief because he is willfully refusing to follow orders. That's what Moses did. When on the second occasion he smote the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Can you imagine that after 40 years of faithfully putting up with those miserable, griping, complaining, slimy, disobedient, wicked Israelites? And he kept on pushing, and he kept on pushing, he kept on leading, kept on leading. After 40 years, he saw the land, but he didn't get to go in. When you're that kind of a soldier, you risk the wrath of the commander-in-chief because as God said to Moses, Moses understood and Moses willfully disobeyed. The enemy may be unlawful, but the commander-in-chief has the lawful authority to put the miscreant soldier to death if his negligence, sloth, and personal comfort jeopardize or cause the death of his fellow soldiers. God took Moses home. Paul says that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about some Christians in the church who had been abusing the Lord's table. You've heard me preach on that on Communion Sunday, so I won't preach on it again here, but some were sick and some were falling asleep. That is, they died because they had not come to the Lord's table as they should have. And some were getting drunk and some were gluttonizing and some were pigging out on the food. Because the Lord's table is designed to point us to the truth of the death of Christ. And that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And that Christ in his own body, body bore our sins on Calvary's tree. That we being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. And when you treat any of the symbols of God in that way, you put yourself in front of the firing squad, God's firing squad. The symbols of God are very important to God. God has given us many different kinds of symbols. For example, he's given us marriage. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge, but the marriage bed is undefiled. Because you see, the marriage relationship reflects the relationship between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And that is a holy and a pure relationship. We need to be very careful with the way in which we treat the symbols that God has given to us. And Moses failed to do that. What symbol was that? Well, Moses struck the rock the second time. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us, and the rock that followed them was Christ. The one who provided the manna in the wilderness. The one who provided the, the, the water in the wilderness. A rock that was a movable rock, a gigantic rock, but it was with them all the time. He says that was Christ. Jesus Christ is the rock and he's the chief cornerstone. Paul says that rock was Christ. Moses broke the typology. He broke the picture because Jesus Christ was smitten only once for our sins. He does not have to be smitten again a second time for our sins. All we have to do is speak to the rock. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. The work of water from all unrighteousness. Oh, dear people, the Old Testament is filled with pictures of Christ. The tabernacle in the wilderness, the different articles within the tabernacle, the high priest wearing his holy garments and entering once a year into the Holy of Holies and sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. And his band on his head says, Kadesh Shaveh. Holiness to the Lord. 
and the mercy seat in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus Christ is our hilasterion. He is our mercy seat. The one by whom the priest and the sacrifice and the blood by whom we come to God who dwells in the midst of the chariot bim, in the holiest of holies. Dear people, God expects precise obedience. Not general, it's good enough for the government kind of work. Sorry, I got off the subject. When you're that kind of a soldier, you put yourself in serious jeopardy with the commander-in-chief. Application. Knowing theology is irrelevant unless there is personal application. So here it is. What's the personal application from these two verses, Ephesians 6, 10, and 11? Here it is. The church is not here for your personal pleasure when it is convenient to come. It is here, remember we're spiritual warfare, it is here for your protection and God put you here to protect the other soldiers in this church. You need to be involved in personal prayer, that's for sure, but you also need to be involved in corporate prayer to accomplish those goals. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. First thing we learn is wrestling is used as the illustration concerning how we are to do battle. Remember, it's a warfare thing. You've got all this armor, but suddenly he's talking about wrestling. Now that might seem odd, but it is totally appropriate in context. In wrestling, you don't kill your opponent. The devil and demons can kill you, but you can't kill them. Your goal is to get points against your opponent and, if possible, to pin him to the mat. I know. I used to be a high school wrestler. I came in second in the Ivy League Championships, losing my final match by only one point in the Ivy League Finals. But you know what? I lost the match. I hope you get the point. All the devil has to do is beat you by one point and he wins. You're not wrestling against another human being. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood, which is what Paul says here. So even if the devil is using other human beings to attack you, the real opponent is invisible. Your real opponent is not just one demon, but the text uses four different words against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And as you might expect, those are military terms for a hierarchy or, or an echelon of well-organized, highly mobile, deadly powerful, and swiftly connected military personnel. Number three, the devil and his demons are not a bunch of independent neighborhood thugs and hoodlums. They have a military plan. They have a specific strategy. They have resources and organizational skills. They do not work independently. They work together to accomplish a common goal, the defeat of every Christian alive on planet Earth and thus the defeat of God's work on earth because God has ordained that the gospel will be carried to the ends of the earth by real people. The devil's goal is to stop the spread of the gospel. And you know something, friends? He will kill the messengers if he possibly can. The four words that are used here. The first word is RK, like in archangel, that means the first ones. We wrestle against principalities. That's the word translated principalities, the first ones. That's used by Paul of angels and demons who are invested with power. I want you to take your Bibles because I don't want to just read these verses to you. I want you to read them with me. 
So please take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8. Let's see a few places where this is used, so you'll see it both in good contexts and in bad contexts. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. We'll start reading in verse 35. Our word shows up in verse 38. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So this sounds like we're in a pretty tough situation. Sounds like a pretty bad fight's going on here. Sounds like somebody's trying to get you, does it? Paul says, yeah, we're in that. But can any of those things separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. The conqueror just wins. One who is more than a conqueror not only wins, but he does something else. Through him that loved us, for I am persuaded. Now listen to what the things are listed here. Because two of them are found over there in Ephesians chapter 6. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, there are the two words, principalities and powers, and it's in the context of angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some people are afraid of the war. Back when I was going to high school and college, the Vietnam War was in progress. And there were lots of hippie protesters, the peaceniks. And they decided that they were going to walk around in, you know, scuffy blue jeans, scraggly long hair. Well, there's some of those people still around today. And um, wearing the peace symbol. And uh, going, peace, brother, peace, brother, peace, brother. But they were chickens. They would not go if they were cold. They held all kinds of demonstrations and sit-ins and that kind of stuff. They were scared. They're Christians who are scared of the spiritual warfare. And so they try as hard as possible not to stand out in the crowd. Not to in any way let somebody else know that they're a Christian. In fact, like the old saying, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Paul is telling us here, we do not need to be afraid in the hottest part of the battle. If we are fighting for Jesus Christ, if he is our great commander-in-chief, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear friends, we have a sovereign God. He not only just looks out and says, oh yeah, I've got a big, great big massive army of Christians out there, and some of them are kind of compromising, but that's okay. And some over here are fighting fundamentals. No, well, that's okay too. And most of them are these good, solid, middle-of-the-roaders who basically do nothing. Jesus died for you. That's the ultimate supreme sacrifice in any military conflict. To die for those you love. If he gave the supreme and ultimate sacrifice, is there anything that can separate you from the love of Christ? Do you not feel compelled to take that message to those who have never heard? Are you not willing to risk your job, your reputation, your approval by your comrades, your comfort, your security, 
being far from home, going to a place where maybe you never get a shower except once every six months, some place where you've got to live in a sort of a grass hut kind of arrangement instead of a big multi-million dollar house with all of its amenities, where perhaps your husband or your wife or your children may die from some horrible disease, are you not willing to risk everything for Jesus who loved you and gave himself for you? Oh, that God would keep me from being a chicken. I hope you can say the same thing. And then by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, live that way. Well, our time is almost up, but let's at least try one more verse. Look over to 1 Corinthians 15. I've got like 10 verses on just this first word, the RK, the first ones, and then we've got powers and rulers and so on like that. Uh, anyway, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, as you know, as you're turning there, 1 Corinthians 15 is the great resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us the gospel. It tells us that in verses 3 and 4 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. How the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel which we preach. That's the gospel wherein we stand. That's which we receive. That's the gospel of which we are saved. That's what Paul says in verses 1 and 2. That's the gospel that God has given to us to preach to others. That's the gospel that Satan hates. And when you begin to teach that gospel and preach that gospel at large, Satan is going to do everything that he possibly can to stop you. You have engaged in spiritual warfare when you are carrying the message of the great king. So we're over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He's talking about the resurrection. Beginning in verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Now verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. There we have it. He will have put down all the first ones. All the principalities. That's the word translated authority there. Excuse me, power. Exousia is the word translated authority, which is the next word in our list. So all of these things are going to be put down by Jesus Christ in the end. He's coming again. That's the promise. The guarantee of when all this is going to be terminated is guaranteed by the resurrection, is guaranteed a reason that you are guaranteed to rise from the dead, and is the guarantee that ultimately all of those angelic beings, the demons, and Satan himself are going to be put down under the rule of Jesus Christ because he is the victor. It's a rather powerful word. And Paul says, that's the first line of enemies that you face in Ephesians chapter 6. The principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. Do you feel like going into that fight all by yourself? I hope you don't. And that is why it is put in the context of doing everything in the spirit, doing it in prayer in the spirit, and doing it completely covered with the armor of God and the only offensive weapon you have to fight against the devil is one sword. You've got a shield of faith that protects you from the incoming blows, but you've got a sword with which to fight. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4, on every temptation, Jesus quoted Scripture. He quoted the Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. He quoted the Old Testament, which means that the Old Testament is still valid for defeating Satan, as well as your New Testament verses. But on every occasion, he quoted Scripture 
and on every occasion he defeated Satan. Now, anything Jesus would have said would have been scripture because Jesus is God. But for our sakes, because we can't make it up as we go along, Jesus quoted scripture so that we would have the example of how do you do combat with Satan when he attacks? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. John 17, Jesus in his great high priestly prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That is the only guaranteed truth that you have in this world, is the word of God. And Satan cannot stand before the truth for he is a liar and the father of it. John chapter 8, verse 44. So how well do you know your Bible? Do you have a regular scripture memory program? Have you committed key verses to memory that you will be able to use when temptation arises in your life? When you feel like the pressure for this temptation is too strong for you. Do you know 1 Corinthians 10, 13? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. When the devil says this is too strong for you, I'm going to win this one, I'm going to win this one. Do you know how to quote 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and say, no, you're not? Because God has promised that at my point of spiritual growth, nothing is too strong for me spiritually. He never lets anything hit me that would overcome me. He always makes a way of escape. Get behind me, Satan. Do you know the word of God? How much scripture have you memorized? Do you know where to find it? Or just have a general idea that, well, God doesn't like sin, so I guess I better not sin, but... Man, this sure is pretty good looking sin. And maybe that, there's an excuse for this one. I, do you know the word of God? It is your only offensive weapon. And then you keep in com communication with headquarters, praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching the, thereunto with all perseverance in prayer. Do you do it? Not do you know it. You have to know it. But do you do it? Our time is up. At least I got one more verse in there. <laughs> Lord willing, we'll pick up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is nothing too hard for you. And you are our great commander-in-chief. You are our Heavenly Father. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the captain of the host. Our Lord Jesus Christ loved us so much that he will never let any of us be lost who have placed our faith in him. He's placed us in the army. He's given to each one of us different assignments. And some of us have what we think are more glorious assignments and others have what we might think are less glorious assignments. But every soldier is essential to the battle because otherwise he wouldn't be in it. Help us to remember that every one of us is essential to the spiritual warfare in this generation in this nation, in our own communities, in our homes, in this church. And you've brought us together for a purpose, that we should fight together for the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, the one in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is hymn